both got very drunk with disastrous results. John was suddenly hit by a volley of seizures. Each one lasted about five minutes and involved violent convulsions that left him unconscious. Eventually, John managed to get a call through to his father, who drove out to the desert to bring him home. On the way home, him and I just got into some philosophical, you know, questions about everything, and I just would not shut up once I got on the way home. I was going and going. It was like I was wired. It's basically an earthquake within the body. And like any earthquake, there are aftershocks. And like any earthquake that does damage, Things have to be rebuilt. Things have to subside. On a path, John walks with his father. Mainly what I deal with is the aftermath, particularly with this last episode. It was very much like stepping into a Salvador Dali painting. Okay, it, instantly everything was surreal. The two walk under the trunk of a dead tree. And that's, in essence, what his seizures are all about the aftermath, um, where it puts his brain, where it puts his memory, where it puts his mind, his thinking ability, everything else. When John's seizures came to an end, he was exhausted, but he felt omnipotent. Now on a suburban street. I went running down the street screaming that I was God. And then this guy came out and I was just like pelvic thrust at him and his wife, and I was like, you want an effing bet? I ain't God. And I said, literally, you get back in here. What do you think you're doing? You know, you're disturbing the neighbors, you're gonna call the cops. What is this all about? I kind of just looked at him cool and calm and apologized to him, and I'm like, no, nah, no one's gonna call the police. Like, it, I didn't say this last part, but I'm thinking to myself, no one's going to call the police on God. At the seashore, John stares out at the breaking waves. John had never been religious, yet the onset of his seizures triggered overwhelming spiritual feelings. Far below, a girl digs in the sand. It had been known for a long time that some patients with seizures originating in the temporal lobes have intense religious auras, intense experience of God visiting them. Sometimes it's a personal God, sometimes it's a more diffuse feeling of being one with the cosmos. Everything seems suffused with meaning. The patient will say, finally, I see what it's all really about, doctor. I really understand God. I understand my place in the universe, in the cosmic scheme. Why does this happen? And why does it happen so often in patients with temporal lobe seizures? On a path bordered by brush and trees, John walks by a sand-colored ridge. Ramachandran met John shortly after the episode in the desert. He was still feeling the extreme highs and lows that follow his seizures. Ramachandran was about to witness the emotional intensity that John endures. In Ramachandran's office. I've been in so much pain that I'd rather be shot to death, dude, or just whipped to death. Mm -hmm. whipped also, also to death. joy? Yeah, I've Somewhere. been in so much joy that I would rather be left alone. Get, get, take, take everything away and just let me sit there and have that much joy. I feel like I can float and stuff sometimes, you know? Okay. It's just, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like the best. There were times where he would have seven or eight grand mal seizures in a day. Mm -hmm. He would never come back to this reality during that time. I have looked in his eyes in those times and I have seen, seen a cry for help. John looks up. No, I mean, you guys, that's the thing, though. A lot of other people can just walk around and see the beauty of the world. I can... He shakes his head as a tear rolls down his cheek. <sighs> Sorry. Uh -huh. It's not as beautiful. On the cliff, John stands with his father. A sea breeze blows as John turns his boyish face to the view. He has a seizure, he'll want to talk philosophy. An indigo blue sky frames the father and son. He'll want to discuss all the things that are floating around in this stew he's got up here that he's trying to reconstruct. Thoughts that he may have had just, just floating through his mind while he was in a seizure mode uh -huh. may come surfacing. I see, okay. Okay, yeah, it's yeah. all... But also um, you said he's become more emotional because, because of the seizure, so that's, mm -hmm. that's helpful too. Much more sensitive. 
but oddly enough, not in regards to himself, okay? okay? But in regards to atrocities, disasters, things like that, anywhere and everywhere. Oh. Wrongs done to other people. Oh my God. And you know what? I am so right in my own head. I know I could go out there and get people to follow me. <laughs> not like these wackos with sheets on their heads. Not like those idiots. Right. But now it's just the new generation of the prophets. Yep. And are, were all the prophets people that were flopping around on the ground? Is that what this whole message was? The gift from the gods this whole time? That's possible, isn't it? Yeah. I've never been religious ever. People say, no, you can't see into the future. Uh-uh. That's what that gift is, but you gotta pay for it by getting slammed around. V.S. Ramachandran, UC San Diego. Now, why do these patients have intense religious experiences when they have these seizures? And why do they become preoccupied with theological and religious matters even in between seizures? One possibility is that the seizure activity in the temporal lobe somehow creates all kinds of odd, strange emotions in the person's mind, in the person's brain. And this welling up of bizarre emotions may be interpreted by the patient as, as visits from another world uh, or as God is visiting me. Maybe that's the only way he can make sense of this welter of strange emotions uh, going on in his brain. Another possibility is that this has something to do with the way in which the temporal lobes are wired up to deal with the world emotionally. John walks down the brush-bordered path. As we walk around and interact with the world, you need some way of determining what's important, what's emotionally salient, and what's relevant to you versus something trivial and unimportant. A cactus with flat, spiny joints and a gangly tree sit along the path. How does this come about? We think what's critical is the connections between the sensory areas in the, in the temporal lobes and the amygdala, which is the gateway to the emotional centers in the brain. In computer animation, the emotional center sits between the amygdala. The strength of these connections is what determines how emotionally salient something is. And therefore, you could speak of a, a sort of emotional salience landscape with hills and valleys corresponding to what's important and what's not important. A computer image of light traveling along pathways in the temporal lobe dissolves into footage of the pockmarked sea cliff. And each of us has a slightly different emotional salience landscape. John stands on the deck at the top of the scarred cliff. Now consider what happens in temporal lobe epilepsy. When you have repeated seizures, what might be going on is an indiscriminate strengthening of all these pathways. It's a bit like water flowing down rivulets along the cliff surface. Vein-like channels run down the face of the cliff. When it rains repeatedly, there's an increasing tendency for the water to make furrows along one pathway, and this progressive deepening of the furrows artificially raises the emotional significance of some categories of inputs. Ramachandran walks along the beach. So instead of just finding lions and tigers and mothers emotionally salient, he finds everything deeply salient. For example, a grain of sand, a piece of driftwood, seaweed. All of this becomes imbued with deep significance. Leading in different directions, footprints mark the sand. The impressions of some tracks are deeper than others. Now this tendency to ascribe cosmic significance to everything around you might be akin to what we call a mystical experience or a religious experience. Ramachandran continues along the beach. On the sandy path, John walks by pine trees, their thin branches and green needles waving in the breeze. For Ramachandran, John's story is the basis of one of his most intriguing and controversial theories. Could there be a specialized area of the brain that drives human beings to seek religion? A few years ago, the popular press inaccurately quoted me as having claimed that there is a God center or a G spot in the temporal lobes. And now this is complete nonsense. There is no specific area in the temporal lobe concerned with God. But it's possible there are parts of the temporal lobes whose activity is somehow conducive to religious belief. Now, this seems unlikely, but it might be true. Now, why might we have 
neural machinery in the temporal lobes for belief in religion. Well, belief in religion is widespread. Every tribe, every society has some form of religious worship. And maybe the reason it evolved, if it did evolve, is that it is conducive to the stability of society. In John's neighborhood, ranch-style homes line the street. And this may be easiest if you believe in some sort of supreme being. And that may be one reason why religious sentiments evolved in the brain. In John's house. The only reason I probably would get rid of the seizures and epilepsy because I've never even seen them is because of my family, because of him. I would, I would keep them for those visions because of the way I see the world falling into place and things like that. It's a wild little place to, to be stuck in there. But it also seems like a key. And right now I haven't learned how to get to the key without, use the key without those seizures. If I was told that I'd never have a chance to have that key again, sorry, I'm gonna hold on to that thing. Just because some patients with temporal lobe seizures have intense religious experiences, this does not in any way invalidate that experience for that patient. In the bar, John shoots a game of pool. In fact, it can very often enrich the patient's life enormously, and it poses a dilemma very often for the physician because what right do we have to treat the patient with medication or with surgery, thereby, in some instances, depriving him of these valuable experiences. From the bar, John's father watches him play. Our view flashes white, then turns jumpy and blurry as John makes a shot. To me, the exciting thing is that subjects like God and religion can now be actually addressed by us scientists. In slow motion, John straightens after a shot, his eyes on the table. We can begin to ask questions about religion and God and begin to approach these questions by listening to these patients, by talking with them, and by studying them. Ramachandran walks along the beach. Now a brain revolves, showing its wrinkled gray surface. It's a tragic irony that today's breakthroughs in our understanding of the human brain are made possible by the misfortune of brain injury. For centuries, philosophers have labored to understand God, consciousness, and the mysteries of human nature. Now, perhaps science will have its chance. Ramachandran walks at the foot of the scarred cliff. On NOVA's website, Investigate the remarkable complexity of the mind through other unusual case studies collected by Dr. Ramachandran on pbs.org or America Online keyword PBS. Vision of the Media Access Group at WGBH, described by Beth Molden and Francis Mahoney, read by Peter Haydu. For more about DVS, call 1-800-333-1203. To order this show or any other NOVA program for $19.95 plus shipping and handling, call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424. Next time on NOVA. The doctor said that there had been an accident. We can impose a gender identity on a newborn. He did not say it was an experiment. I was never happy as Brenda, never. Sex Unknown. Credits. Produced by Emma Crichton Miller. Narrated by Rena Baskin. Executive producer Paula S. Absol. Copyright 2001 WGBH Educational Foundation. NOVA is a production of WGBH Boston. Corporate funding for NOVA is provided by Sprint and the Northwestern Mutual Foundation. Additional funding is provided by the Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.